my name is Emily Bynan and today I'm going to talk about Mahler's Ninth Symphony. Now the story goes that Mahler was so haunted by the curse of the Ninth, ninth. the myth that composers writing a Ninth Symphony were somehow taunting death, that after his Eighth Symphony, the so-called Symphony of a Thousand, he put off writing a Ninth Symphony and went on to write Das Lied von der Erde or the Song of the Earth, which is in effect a symphony disguised as a song cycle with two solo singers. But he did eventually start work on his Ninth Symphony in 1908 and completed it just a year later. But it wasn't premiered until 1912, so Mahler never actually heard it performed, nor knew what a huge success it would become in the coming century. Today it's perhaps one of the favourite of all the Mahler symphonies, and actually, in a BBC poll in 2016, it was rated number four of the all-time great symphonies. And I'll tell you what the other three were at the end of this video. It's a gigantic work, usually lasting 80 or 90 minutes. And Mahler himself said, a symphony must be like the world, it must contain everything. And when you're playing it in the orchestra, it really does feel like a musical description of an entire lifetime. By the way, Mahler did beat The Curse of the Night <laughs> and had actually pretty much written a complete draft of his 10th symphony when he died in 1911. But sadly, he hadn't completed its orchestration. <laughs> the composer Alban Berg wrote about the first movement the whole movement is based on a premonition of death which constantly recurs. That's why the tenderest passages are followed by tremendous climaxes like new eruptions of a volcano. Indeed, the whole symphony seems tinged with death. Derek Cook, who wrote the most performed completion of Mahler's 10th symphony, called the 9th symphony Mahler's Dark Night of the Soul. The year before writing it, Mahler had lost his beloved four-year-old daughter, Maria, to scarlet fever, and shortly afterwards, he was himself diagnosed with a serious heart condition. Leonard Bernstein suggested that the irregular rhythm of the opening cello and horn pattern was a musical representation of Mahler's own irregular heartbeat. And under the very first violin entry in the piece, Mahler wrote, Leber wohl, farewell. Just take a minute to look at the first page of Willem Mengelberg's score. He conducted the Concertgebouw Orchestra in the first performance of this symphony outside Austria in 1916. And death really does pervade the entire symphony. At the very end, the last note is marked Esterben, dying away. And these two last pages of the score, written for just the strings, so a mere four or five lines, last an astonishing six minutes. And when you're performing it in concert, this sparseness feels so fragile and unbearably touching that sometimes I don't breathe. Bernstein thought that this entire movement was predicting three kinds of death. Mahler's own impending death, the death of tonality, and the death of Western culture in the arts. Oof. Let's get on with the flute solo, shall we? The one you'll be asked in an orchestral audition appears near the end of the first movement. It's a really bizarre passage of just 15 bars marked misterioso, mysteriously. And actually it isn't a solo at all. It's a weirdly wonderful piece of chamber music within this huge symphony. The horn and flute are the main voices with other shorter but essential contributions by the piccolo, violin and oboe. So remember, to be able to imagine them in the audition, so that you're playing along with your imaginary colleagues in your head, you have to be able to play their parts too. So as always, start by listening to the entire passage and looking at the score. 
and maybe even transposing and recording the other parts to help you in your practice. In an audition, this is an excellent excerpt for showing the entire breadth of your dynamic range. We're going from the very softest pianissimo, even on the top C, to the fullest, healthiest fortissimo with an accent, all impeccably in tune, of course. The rhythm is of vital importance as well. Very often the other players have contradictory rhythms, duplets against your triplets or triplets against your semiquavers or sixteenth notes. And these triplets and duplets all pulling against one another create a most wonderful rhythmic tension, which all adds to the harmonic dissonance and discomfort. This passage is packed chock full with swirling torment and anguish. The biggest rhythmic traps to fall into are the slurred over notes, so be sure to be well on time after those longer notes. And to help with this rhythmic accuracy, I would practice it with a metronome on eighth notes or quavers at about 120. So now let's look at the score in detail. The first bar of the Misterioso is an oboe solo marked fortissimo. Then the flute enters with true triplets and a true forte, but really squeezing each and every note out and squirming through these chromatic triplets. And take care that you keep the triplets even despite the articulation through this bar. In the second half of the bar, we want to hear a pronounced diminuendo into the following bar's delicate pianissimo. And there's less rhythmic excitement and tension here too, as the violin takes over for a bar. And I like to imagine that Mahler adds this word espressivo to our BCC in the next bar because we're taking over again from the violin, which would obviously be using a lot of vibrato high up on the E string. Now, don't be shy about giving the middle D sharp quite a lot of sound so that you can make an elegant diminuendo up to the top C. And here I would use this special fingering. Using the gizmo on the B foot joint, put all the fingers down except the thumb. It's a little flatter, but more importantly, it's got a little more resistance. But don't forget to keep that air moving, especially in pianissimo. And don't use any vibrato on this top C. The piccolo is taking over in pianissimo, so it doesn't need to be sostenuto of any sort. And as soon as you start this note, you can really begin to release the sound. In the next bar, be careful that you don't leave the tide over E too late and keep really even rhythmic triplets, even though the dynamic is soft, the character is light and we have this interesting articulation. Take care too that the lower A natural doesn't sound too loud. Enjoy the appoggiatura in the next bar and I would breathe before the trill. It will help with the articulation between the long E and the following trill. And anyway, in the orchestra, it will be covered by the horn. For this top C, I would take the same fingering as before. And once again, take care that you don't leave the long note too late. Now, there is a huge temptation to crescendo at the end of this bar. Don't! Mahler writes pianissimo sempre, which means always soft. So here, the energy and the tension comes from resisting the temptation to get louder. And the first time you can even think about a crescendo is where it's marked on the F sharp. But then really go for it. Look in the next bar and you'll see that the piccolo is doubling the top two notes. So make sure that through this crescendo, the low notes are well in balance with the high ones. On this next bar line, there's very often a tiny comma when we play it in the orchestra just to clear the sound in a big concert hall. And I think it's quite a good idea to do that in the audition too. Make sure that your piano subito is soft enough and sharp enough. Here's yet another tied over note, which is important to keep on time. Then in the next bar, I would use a middle finger F sharp to help with the intonation. And perhaps at the end of the bar, maybe even consider a little compensating crescendo into the low C sharp. Here we have another tied over note, then with a perfectly accurate rhythm, sweep up into the trill, and here I would keep the fourth finger down for the F natural. If you need to, you can sneak a little breath on this bar line, but then absolutely no hint of slowing down or getting softer in this last bar. The music continues. 
we're just a small cog in the huge machine that is the orchestra. This excerpt is a marvellous vehicle for showing your understanding of an extremely complex score and, of course, your masterful control of the instrument. However, in the orchestra, the place which I find almost more challenging than this passage, and certainly far more lonely, happens a minute or two later. The E-flat clarinet has a small lyrical solo, then a first D octave, and then on the second the flute joins in. There's a small opening out of the sound, a crescendo diminuendo. Then Mahler sends the flute soaring up to that top A flat. He marks the score schwebend or floating. So then the solitary flute is gradually abandoned by the rest of the orchestra and drifts down from that top A flat to the bottom G flat all the while pianissimo with an incredibly delicate, fragile sound and always keeping the pitch up. It's an extremely desolate spot and I must say there are few moments in the orchestral literature where I feel more lonely than these few bars. Mahler is always extraordinarily powerful, expressive music. And whilst in the audition, this solo is enormously challenging, in the orchestra, there's another challenge too. And that is, for me, finding a way of being completely committed and involved musically without allowing myself to get totally submerged in Mahler's doom and gloom or carried away with his euphoria. Emotionally and physically, this is a draining symphony. There are some fiddly little soloistic trills in the second movement, which need to be well organized and tidy. And the last movement has lots of high, soft solo passages, which are really useful technical practice. So as always, learn the entire flute part. Now, you'll remember that at the beginning of the video, I mentioned the BBC poll where Mahler's Ninth Symphony came in fourth place in the list of greatest symphonies of all time and I promised you the rest of the results. Drum roll, please. Well, in the third place was Mozart's Jupiter Symphony. In second place was Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. And in first place, Beethoven's Third Symphony, the Eroica. Another wonderful flute part. And coincidentally, that's what I'll talk about in my next video. So I hope you've enjoyed this. See you next time.